Welcome to the Eco Scientist Podcast. My name is Amalia Valley, and I am your host. In this podcast, we're going to be talking about all things science, conservation, and climate. I'm going to dive deep into the ethics, the emotions, and the facts to bring you all the information you need to survive in the world of STEM. So sit down, chill out, and let's get into it. Hello and welcome to episode three of the Eco Scientist podcast. This week, we're going to be talking about getting in front of your peers and gaining experience so that you are as qualified as you can possibly be when you're applying for the job of your dreams or chasing after a promotion. But before we get into that, I just wanted to touch on something a little more serious for a moment. Last week, in episode two of the podcast, I spoke about climate anxiety and I gave you guys five tips to help manage it. In tip number five, I told you guys that you should seek help if you need it. And I mentioned talking to friends and family or seeking professional help from a therapist if necessary. But one thing I did forget to mention and that I would like to mention now is that if you do need professional help with climate anxiety or any mental health issues that you may be facing, but maybe you can't afford to see somebody or maybe you don't have the time or don't feel comfortable talking to someone face to face, It's important to remember that there are lots of other avenues for you to seek help. Here in Australia, we have Beyond Blue, Lifeline Crisis Support and Suicide Prevention, and Kids Helpline, which is for people aged 5 to 25 years. All of these helplines put you in contact with trained mental health professionals for free. Kids Helpline and Beyond Blue also do online chats, so you don't have to talk over the phone if you don't feel comfortable with it. The links for the websites for these helplines will be in the show notes below as well as their phone numbers. For my listeners in other parts of the world, the Global Mental Health Resources Checkpoint has a directory on their website with a list of international mental health providers as well as worldwide emergency numbers. The directory has providers for depression, anxiety, eating disorders, addictions, PTSD, bipolar disorder, and any sexuality or gender-related mental health issues you might have, as well as support for carers and links to local GPs. This one will also be linked in the show notes below and is a really, really good resource for those of you who might travel a lot. So just to reiterate that one, links to all of those helplines as well as their phone numbers will be in the show notes below. And if you are suffering from any mental health issue or are feeling suicidal, please pause this episode right now and call one of those helplines or emergency services if necessary. And remember, you are loved, you are worthy of help, and you are definitely not alone. So now that we've covered that, I feel like we can probably get into today's topic. Today, we're going to be discussing how you can get more experience in your field and become as qualified as possible to put you a step or two in front of other applicants when you're applying for a job or a promotion. Maybe you're in university right now and you're worried about getting a job in the future. Maybe you're chasing a promotion or maybe you're in your 40s about to do a huge career change. It doesn't matter what the situation is, you're probably going to need a lot of experience if you want to get a decently paying job in an area that you love. My interests specifically involve ornithology, which is the study of birds for those of you who may not know, as well as marine science and science communication. Now, there's not a lot of jobs in those areas, and it's the same for a lot of sciences, and I imagine it's similar for those more specialised areas within engineering and technology as well. And when people ask about my degree, they usually reply to my answer with something along the lines of, oh, what kind of job do you expect to get with that? Like a park ranger or something? And while I probably could work as a park ranger if I wanted, that's not what I want to do, and it's not what I plan on doing. And if you're in a field similar to mine, you might be met with these questions a lot. And for some people, it makes you question your ability to get the job that you want. There might be 10 jobs available in the field that you would really like to work in, but there are 500 people applying for the same job as you are. And the thing is that it's like this in almost every specialized field of work that you could imagine. But I don't want you guys to question your abilities to get these jobs. Instead, I want you to expand your skill set and gain experience and I want you to know that you're qualified for these jobs. So if you really, really want that job, if you really want that promotion, you need to work for it and you need to make sure that you stand out. In addition to that, you have those job listings that are like entry level position, best for recent graduates, minimum three years experience necessary. And usually you think, how the hell am I supposed to have three years of experience when I've been qualified for five minutes? 
Well, in this episode, I'm going to tell you how you can do that as well. So today we're going to cover seven things that you can do in order to expand your skill set, gain experience, stand out and get that job that you want. Seven is a random number, I know, but it's my favorite and we're just working with what we got here, guys. So tip number one, the first thing that you need to do, especially if you're still in the early stages of studying or if you're thinking of making that career change, but you haven't taken the leap yet, is you need to volunteer. Now, before you go and close this episode and tell me to shut up, just hear me out because I have a little bit more information for you on volunteering that you might not have heard before. And if you don't like this tip, there's still six others after this one. And trust me, I know, I know you have no time. I know you have no money, but you really got to hear me out on this volunteering thing because it's what's led me to where I am today. So if you're an undergraduate, one thing you can do is you can volunteer for honors and PhD students that are doing research projects. It won't cost you anything. Usually you're already on campus anyway. And for me, this has been one of the most influential things that I've done for my career. More often than not, honors and PhD students need a few extra hands to help collect their data, particularly with fieldwork or even to process that data and doing things that are usually pretty fiddly and time consuming that they don't really have the time to do. But these people are also students themselves and they usually have pretty limited funding, if any at all, to pay for research assistants or secretaries or whoever it is that they need to get the work done. So that's where you can come in. A lot of the time they want volunteers to help them out and because it's unpaid work, most of these people will be happy to train you if there is no one else to help them out or if you do really well, you'll usually get a reference out of it too. This can also lead to more opportunities and Volunteering for someone can often push you into this snowball effect of networking and increase your skills and experience. I did a lot of volunteer work with sporting groups and charities as a kid, so I had a rough idea of how to navigate these things, which was really helpful when I started my degree. But the first volunteer work I did at uni was with an honours student. He was processing data and he needed extra hands, or extra eyes specifically. Basically, he had all of this BRUV footage, and BRUVs, for those of you who don't know, are baited remote underwater video systems, which a lot of marine scientists are starting to use for fieldwork. Basically, a BRUV is just a big long pole with a GoPro camera and a weight on one end and a bag of bait on the other, and you just drop the BRUV into, say, an estuary or into a surf zone or wherever your study site is, and marine animals are attracted to the bait, so they swim into the view of the camera. You just leave the camera out in the field overnight or for a few days and when you come back you have footage that shows you exactly what animals are in the environment. And this is a fairly good way to collect data because it means you can just set and forget and the animals aren't being disrupted by you as a human, which means you're more likely to see something. Now what this guy was doing was identifying the fish species that were in each frame of the video footage and he was counting them to determine the maximum number of individual animals in each frame, which would give him a rough idea of the abundance and the diversity of different species within the study site. All I had to do was identify the fish in the videos and then write down how many of each fish I saw per frame. That was it. Look at a fish, write down what it was and count them. When I first went in, I had this mindset of, I just want to see what marine science is like because I didn't really know what I wanted to do and I thought that trying a little bit of everything would be a great way to find out. I just transferred from a chemistry degree into animal ecology and I was only two weeks into my first semester so I had absolutely no clue what I was doing. I didn't know how to identify fish at all. But the good thing was that this guy was really nice and he gave me species ID books and he had these photos and descriptions of all of the fish that were in the area as well as a couple of other people volunteering for him that were really helpful and showed me how to navigate the book and how to fill out the spreadsheet. After a couple of hours, I got the hang of it and I started working through the footage a little faster than I was at first and it felt really good and it was super rewarding. At the end of it, I learned how to identify a heap of fish. I knew what bruvs were and how they worked before a lot of the other students in my class did and I met a few really cool people. Because I met this honours student, I also met his supervisor, as well as a few of the other honours and PhD students that were in the same department, and that opened up a lot more doors for me. Because I knew some of these people now, it meant that I could volunteer for them too. Their supervisors knew I was keen to help them out, and they were more likely to ask me to volunteer than somebody who they hadn't met before. 
So basically, I helped this one guy one time, I got some new skills, I met a heap of cool people, and I started volunteering for them too. Eventually, after volunteering for a few different people, I saw a post from a PhD student who needed extra hands for some dissections. The project that he was, and still is doing, is really innovative stuff regarding um, sustainable food security, I guess, with seaweed and rabbit fish. And I thought it would be really cool to see what the behind the scenes and, you know, that sort of side of research was like. I knew a little bit about fish by this point, but I hadn't done any dissections on marine animals before. So I thought it would be a really great opportunity to learn a little bit more about their anatomy and to learn a bit more about aquaculture. So I went into the research station to volunteer for a few hours and somehow I ended up being pretty good at it and I helped him out for a whole two days. The coolest thing about this one, though, was that it got me a job. His supervisor had a position available for a research assistant. I lived locally. They liked the way that I worked while I was volunteering, and so I got an interview. Keep in mind that at this stage, I was in my second year at university, so I didn't have a degree yet. I had absolutely no experience working in aquaculture, and I knew nothing about seaweed. But I had some experience in similar areas from volunteering, and I had amazing references from my volunteer work as well. Because of the small amount of experience that I did have, as well as the amazing references that I had from my previous volunteer work, I ended up getting the job. I worked in the aquaculture department for the university at a proper research station that had workers from CSIRO and the Department of Aquaculture and Fisheries for about a year. That is a great job for a second year university student to get. Then I met even more cool people from really big research institutions with years of experience and I learned a whole lot. Now I know heaps about seaweed and growing it and how not to kill it and I learned all of this stuff about aquaculture and sustainability and fish and all this chemistry behind maintaining water quality and somehow a decent amount about plumbing too which I did not expect and I did a little bit of lab work as well. To top it all off, the pay was great. I ended up buying a car, my partner and I moved out of a share house and into our own place and it was really good and it just started with some volunteer work. Over summer, I did more research assistant work with the same group that I'd volunteered for a while um, and the surveys that we did were things that I used to volunteer to do, but this time they paid me to do it and that wouldn't have happened if I didn't volunteer for them for so long already. And that's the coolest thing about volunteering. It's about building trust and relationships with people so that they know you're in it for the right reasons. And that's the biggest thing that people tend to get caught up with. I know that this episode is about increasing your skills so that you can get the job, but you can't volunteer for someone with the sole purpose of just getting a reference. These kinds of people want volunteers who are passionate about the subjects or people that are trying new things to figure out where they fit in. They want people who are going to help out because they really want to learn new skills. They don't want people who are just there to get a reference. And if you're just volunteering for references and not because you really want to learn those skills, people are going to see right through you. In addition to that, you're going to be getting in the way of people who really are interested. So just make sure that you're being reasonable, honest and kind guys and only volunteer for good reasons. If you don't know where to start, Just email people and ask them if they need volunteers. The worst thing that can happen is that they will say no, but it's all about networking, so just keep persisting and it will definitely be worth it in the end. If you're not at university and you're wanting to increase your skills or try new things, you can still volunteer by emailing departments at universities and seeing if they need people to help out. They might get back to you, but they might not. So another thing that you can do is look for other volunteer-run organisations in your field of interest. There are a lot of people out there that need help and usually charities and non-for-profits need volunteers all of the time. My best friend volunteers for a wildlife rescue organisation which has given her a heap of contacts and skills and the organisation isn't affiliated with the university so anyone can join them and there's lots of other places like that that are looking for volunteers too. If you're in technology, you can volunteer as a website designer or in a robotics lab. For those of you who might be interested in engineering, in Australia we have Engineers Without Borders and they have a directory of loads of different volunteering opportunities and internships that are available across the country as well as internationally, so I'll link that website in the show notes below. 
But basically, there's something out there for everyone in every field. You just have to go and find it. All you have to do is get on Google and search for organizations in your area by typing the area you live in, followed by the area you're interested in, and then the word volunteer. Don't go typing a whole string of words into Google or sentences about the topic because you're going to get a lot less answers. So just keep the search simple and you'll get a lot more results. So for example, if I live in Toronto and I'm interested in robotics, I might Google Toronto, comma, robotics, comma, volunteer. And then just look through all the search results until I find something I like. It's that simple. There are also volunteer experiences you can do overseas or you can go on research expeditions, but these usually come with fees or they might have long-term commitments. One good one here in Australia is Sea Shepherd. You can get on one of their boats and volunteer for them at sea, but you have to join an expedition for a minimum of a month and most of the expeditions last about four months. Another cool one here in Australia is humpbacks and high rises on the Gold Coast. They have shorter expeditions that usually last about three days, but you have to pay a fee of about 500 Australian dollars to join them. And that's just because these places have costs to cover with their research and other things like equipment. And at least you know that your money is going towards helping researchers out. So I think it's a really good option if you do have a bit of spare money or spare time because not everyone goes on these. I know in the US there are adult STEM camps and summer camps for teens in STEM too, so that's definitely something to look into. One thing to keep in mind here is that a lot of people, like myself, can't afford to do these things or some of us don't have the time, so if you do have the privilege and the time, I really do highly recommend it. Whatever kind of volunteering you choose to do, it will definitely get your foot in the door. It'll help you meet new people, you'll learn new skills, and you might find new interests. I mean, I used to think that working with seaweed would be boring, but I can tell you right now, seaweed is so bloody cool. I love seaweed. Anyway, <laughs> before I get carried away with the algae talk, let's jump into the next tip, which is to get involved in citizen science. This one kind of comes off the back of volunteering, but it's still a little different. Citizen science is a fairly new concept and citizen science's organisations allow members of the general public to collect data in order to collaborate with scientists. One of my favourite citizen science organisations is Coral Watch. Just FYI, I am a Coral Watch ambassador, but this is in no way sponsored and they don't pay me, so this is definitely 100% my opinion. I think citizen science is great. With Coral Watch specifically, you get this little slate, which is a coral health chart, and it just has some colours on the front, and each colour has a number underneath it. And then on the back is a little table. So basically, we give these health charts to people who snorkel or scuba dive, and all the divers have to do is hold the slate up to a coral, and then write down which colour on the chart matches the colour of the coral. It's really easy, and it can be really fun. The coolest thing about it, though, is that when we notice that the colours are different in the reefs and when the colours of the corals are starting to get lighter, it sends the humans at Coral Watch an alert to let them know that the reef might be bleaching where the data was collected. The person who collected the data also gets an alert, and then the authorities, like the marine park or scientists that might be working in the area, if they wanted to, they could try to do something about the threats that might be causing the corals to stress out and bleach. So if there's a high volume of tourists and the corals are bleaching because the water is warming, we know that we can reduce the access of tourists so that the corals are under just a little bit more stress. There's heaps of citizen science organisations out there like Coral Watch. Most of these organisations are environmental centred, but they're usually run by universities or groups that are really involved with their communities. So it's a great way to get experience, a really awesome way to meet influential people and a good way to get your foot in the door. Something anyone can do to help improve their skill set and, and become more qualified is to do MOOCs or certificates online. So that's my next tip for you guys. So to start off with, a MOOC is a mass open online course, that's M-O-O-C, and they're usually run by universities. The ones that I have done are free and there's usually a range of topics from coding to basic mathematics and chemistry all the way to evolution or business management. They're courses that you can do in your own time and you can usually do them at your own pace. And at the end of it, you get a certificate that you can print and add to your list of qualifications. 
The good thing about a MOOC is that you can acquire baseline information and understanding on almost any topic that will probably be enough to get you by if you don't have the exact skills that someone is after. So for example, say that you're a data analyst and a biologist has hired you to help process some of their data. Maybe their water sample data includes pH readings, and as a data analysis without any background in biology and chemistry, you might not exactly understand how the relationships between pH and their other variables occur. Now, numbers are just numbers, and usually it won't matter, you'll be able to analyse them even if you don't exactly understand what they mean. But if you have a better understanding of these chemical relationships, maybe you'll be able to process the data easier or something. I don't really know exactly how this works for data analysis. When I process my own data that I have collected, I understand exactly what it all means. But if you get hired as a data analysis, you're just looking at numbers and you might not be given the background information or maybe you don't understand it because it's not in your field. And I can't imagine what that would be like. But what if you did have the background information? You could do a chemistry or biology MOOC in a week and you would have enough basic understanding so that you might be the best data analysis that that biologist has ever hired. And then you get rehired for all of their projects and then you have a killer reference and now you know some stuff about biology that you didn't know before. Sweet. You can also do a lot of other certificates online or even in person that might make a huge difference when you're applying for a job or a promotion. For example, in marine science, having a boat license and scuba qualifications are really valuable. But when you do a marine science degree, your lecturers aren't going to make you get those qualifications and a lot of graduates don't have them because they haven't thought of it until they go and apply for a job that says graduate position available, must have a rescue driver qualification and coxswain's license. So they can't apply for the job because they don't have the qualifications. So they go and get the qualifications, but it costs them a heap of money, which they don't have because they've got no job. And by the time they're qualified, someone else has already been hired. So if you're studying marine science, you should try and get those licenses while you're still at university. Here in Australia, a lot of ecology jobs require you to have experience driving four-wheel drives with a manual license. I think you guys in the US call it stick shift, but here we call it manual. Um, anyway, basically, if you drive a manual four-wheel drive out bush, and you can do that confidently, and the other applicants can't, they're going to hire you because they don't want to waste their time teaching a city kid how to drive. Now, if you are a city kid and you don't own a four-wheel drive and you can't drive manual, you can actually do a four-wheel drive driving course and they'll take you off-road and they'll teach you to do things like how to pull the car out if it's stuck and how to set up a winch and just basic driving techniques. So do extra certificates, do MOOCs, do things that give you these skills. And if you do already have these skills, having a physical certificate to show an employer as proof is still really helpful. I've been driving off-road for years and I think I have more off-road experience than experience on sealed bitumen, but I've still enrolled myself in a four-wheel drive course so that I have a piece of paper to prove that experience. Because if you have more experience than someone, but they have the piece of paper and you don't, they will probably still get the job. A lot of my friends have wildlife handling certificates which come in handy, so that's another one to look out for. There's a lot of other certificates that you can get and some that you definitely should prioritise. First aid is definitely one of them. It doesn't matter whether you're a fieldwork loving ecologist or you're an engineer that rarely gets to leave the office. Having a first aid certificate is really valuable and if you don't have one and somebody else does and there's nothing else separating you for them in a, in a job interview, having a first aid certificate might be the thing to tip you over. There's also other courses that you can do in basic IT or, you know, like how to use different computer programs or do basic coding or web design. There's certificates for business and pretty much anything really. So don't be scared to do certificates that lie a little bit out of your general qualifications. One of the lecturers at my university does a lot of work with reptiles and he's built these little robots to simulate the movements of lizards, which is pretty epic. But you wouldn't really sit there and look at an ecologist and think, you know what, that guy needs to know how to build robots. 
Well, some do. And if it's something that interests you, just go get the certificate because you never know when it might come in handy. And being good at a little bit of everything is a really good trait to have. The next thing that you can do to expand your knowledge and your skill set is to read books, listen to podcasts and TED Talks and go to seminars and conferences. Listening to other people talk about your field of work might help you broaden your knowledge on the topic to a whole new level that you might not expect. This idea that people get that you will be as knowledgeable as you can possibly be in your field just from a university degree alone is absolutely pure nonsense. The most knowledgeable people in the world didn't get their wealth of knowledge from listening to a select few people. Usually they maybe got a degree, but they've listened to thousands of different influences from lots of different places and sources and combined all of this information to build on their own ideas. And that's how we evolve as a species, by bouncing information off one another and passing knowledge down. There have been a number of times myself where I've listened to TED Talks and I've learned so much about things that I didn't even realize were related to other things. There is this whole interconnected, absolutely endless supply of knowledge that other people have to offer you. And listening to all different kinds of people talking about these things is such a great way to take it all in. If you go to seminars or conferences, you can hear new information or listen to people talk about things for the first time publicly, which I think is really, really cool. And these events are also amazing for networking. You might meet people who need volunteers or maybe they have jobs available. Or maybe they just have a wealth of knowledge that you can benefit from. So if you have the opportunity to attend a seminar or a conference, I highly recommend that. But basically, this whole tip of expanding your knowledge through the media you consume plays off the tips that I spoke about in the last episode. So in episode two, I said that two of the things that you can do to help reduce your climate anxiety were to get off social media and to change the media you're consuming from negative influences like Instagram models trying to sell you skinny teas to more positive informational media. And these are some examples of those kinds of media. So instead of watching videos on some beauty guru's favorite products for the month of March, you could watch something more constructive like a TED talk. TED Talks have honestly given me so many ideas and they've added so much fuel to some of my thought patterns and really given me clarity in a lot of situations, so I highly recommend them. I remember in high school, I used to secretly watch TED Talks in the back of my modern history classroom because I hated it so much. Disclaimer, I do like ancient history though, so please don't hate me, but that's a story for another time Um, and I'll leave the TEDx link in the show notes below for you guys. But, you know, just read books when you're in public transport instead of sitting on Facebook or Instagram, just things like that. And for me, I like to read nonfiction books about nutrition and psychology and science and politics. And there's nothing wrong with reading fiction because you can learn a lot from fiction books and stories. But if the goal is to expand your knowledge on a particular topic, why not read about it? Plus, books are a lot more heavily regulated than other sources of media. I could go on YouTube tomorrow and I could make a video about how to cure your cancer by eating nothing but gummy worms. And people could go on there and watch it and most likely it wouldn't get taken down. But books are reviewed and the publication processes are pretty lengthy and you can't just publish and print hard copies of a book without knowing something about the topic. So, you know, for the most part, books are far more reliable than YouTube videos or Instagram posts. So it's a lot more reliable media and constructive media to be consuming. The next tip I have is to start a club or join a club in your local community or at your university. I joined and then was a board member for the Animal Ecology Student Society at my university, which was super fun. And I learned a lot from the other board members, which was cool. But there are also robotics clubs, a lot of universities, as well as community groups that cover pretty much anything you want to do in your free time. And if there isn't a group to join that you're interested in, you can start one. It's a really great way to meet new people and to network and to practice your skills. So I definitely recommend that. The next tip I have is to travel. Traveling is a great way to learn new skills that can be really valuable in the workplace. Like, for example... 
you might get a little culture shock and develop a new level of cultural sensitivity in the workplace that you didn't have before. Or you might learn a new language that will come in handy when you have to do an international conference or a deal or something. You will also make connections with people that will be valuable to you for the rest of your life. And you'll be able to connect theory to practical situations that become actual skills that you have actual proof of. One example for me in my personal life was my trip to Fiji. I went with the university and I stayed in a rural village and as part of my research project I had to interview people. I had to use a translator and in a lot of cases I had to be really sensitive with the way that I asked the questions that I did to make sure that what I was saying was clear and to make sure I didn't upset anyone. You know when you're asking questions to someone from a different culture in a different country You have to be careful to acknowledge their religion, their traditions, their way of life and a whole bunch of things. Um, And when you word things, you have to be really, really conscious of this and you have to be conscious of your own culture too, because what might be normal in your culture might be considered rude in somebody else's. So there's a lot of things that you have to be aware of in these situations and it doesn't matter if you just mean well, you have to do well too. Now, I had these skills on a basic level before I went to Fiji, but when I was there, I developed these skills to a level that I didn't know was possible. And now I have physical proof of these skills in the form of a research paper and photographs and stories of my experiences, as well as so many beautiful memories for myself. So when I tell an employer that I have really good intercultural communication skills, I can prove it to them and they know that I'm not full of it. Because any white girl that goes overseas to a tourist spot and talks to some people can be like, um, I went to Bali and I was nice to the brown people and I'm like so culturally sensitive and I just really acknowledge people you know. No, that's not how it works. Sit down, be quiet. No one's going to believe a damn word you say, especially when they see photos of you on your Instagram at a bar surrounded by 10 other white girls or in a temple that just became a tourist hotspot dressed in something that is not culturally appropriate at all. But when you can show someone manuscripts from a professional interview with a reference from a translator or photographs of you with a huge group of people in a professional setting in culturally appropriate clothing, employers know that you're being honest. So you need to make sure that if you're traveling with the intent of expanding your skill set, Try and go on trips that are designed to do this specifically. If you are just traveling for fun, that's great. I'm not telling you not to because traveling should be fun and it's supposed to be amazing. And you should take photos of the fun things you do overseas and you should post them on Instagram or whatever you want to do. But don't use those fun trips as examples of someone who is well-traveled in a professional sense because these trips are very different. I'm not going to go into too much detail with the traveling stuff though, because next week we're going to talk about how you can travel for free as a university student, which I'm super excited to talk about. Another tip that I have for those of you that are looking at your dream job or dreaming about a promotion but aren't anywhere near qualified yet, but you need a job now, the best thing that you can do is to get work in an entry level position first. Get work as an intern or as a research assistant and get prepared to do the dirty work and then climb up the ladder. You aren't going to walk out of university with a piece of paper and then just waltz into your dream job. That's not how it works. So while you're studying or if you've already finished, get work in small roles first. Do part-time work, seasonal work or just casual entry-level positions. And if it's not enough to pay the bills, work in a cafe on the side or something like that. It doesn't matter how much you need a full-time job or how much you want a specific position. If you don't have the experience, you're not going to get it. So that's that. And you need to start at the bottom and you need to work your way up. And if that means working two casual positions instead of working one job full-time, then that's what you're going to have to do. The good thing is, though, that a lot of people don't do this anymore. So employers usually have a lot of respect for people that do. If you work your way up and if you don't complain about it, because chances are they were probably in your shoes 10 years ago, they might really like you and they want you to work for this stuff. So that's what you've got to do. Another thing to keep in mind is that an entry level position doesn't have to be your forever job. If you're working as a research assistant for a year and you don't really like it and then your dream job comes along, you can still apply for it. And hey, now you have a year of experience in your field in a lower position 
plus probably a reference or two and a decent network. You might get the job of your dreams and then you can leave your research assistant job for a better role. And you can just keep trading out these jobs for better positions until you get to where you want to be. As long as you're not changing jobs too often and as long as you're going up the ladder and not climbing down it, this is totally fine. That's how you keep climbing the ladder. That's how you get better and that's how you get experience. So I really encourage you guys to do that. And to tie up all of these tips, make sure that you're networking. That's my biggest tip today, guys. Make sure you're networking. Message people, talk to people, email them, follow them online, go to conferences or whatever it is you want to do. Just make sure you network. A lot of the time, it's about who you know as well as what you know. And if you network and get your name out there, you're far more likely to get a good job than somebody who hasn't networked. And then you can be a bit picky and you might just get the job of your dreams first go. Just this week, I've been given two job offers from people that I've networked with and volunteered for before. Both of these jobs haven't been posted online yet and I turned them both down because they're not what I'm looking for right now and I can afford to be picky. But the point of this is, if I did need those jobs or if either of those roles was my dream job, I could have said yes and I could have gotten either position before they were advertised just because I've done my networking. So I really think that networking is one of the most powerful things that you can do if you want to get yourself out there, if you want to get a good job, and if you want to excel in your career. So to summarize all of those tips, the best things that you can do to help you get the job of your dreams or to get you closer to that promotion is to number one, volunteer. Number two, consume knowledge broadening media like podcasts, TED Talks, and books. Number three, get certificates, complete MOOCs, and get more qualified on paper. Number four, join or start a club. Five, travel. Six, get an entry-level job first, and even if it's not the one you want, just work your way up the ladder. And seven, network, network, and network some more. So that's all the tips I have for you guys today. Don't forget that next week we will be discussing how you can travel for free as a university student. So make sure that you tune in for that one, which will be posted on either Monday or Tuesday. I'll update you guys on the Instagram page. And as usual, if you have any questions, you can send them to me on Instagram. My handle is at ecoscientist, which is spelt E-C-O-S-C-I-E-N-T-I-S-T, all one word. You can also contact me or read a little more on my blog, which will be linked in the show notes below. So with that, guys, I'm going to wrap it all up here and I'll talk to you next week. That was episode three of the Eco Scientist podcast. I'm Amalia Valley, wishing you a great day or a great night wherever you are.